test basic FTP handling. That sounds sure. reasonable, doesn't it? Should we have a quick yeah. look? Sure, sure. For one thing, because we, we're using Testify in this package, and it might be interesting for people to see how that actually works. Now, you know, because you, you know, write Go tests and you, you use the standard library testing package, you know that if you want to fail a test, you use this magical T and you can call t.error or mm -hmm. t.fatal or something like that. Um, that's all right, and that's basically all you need, isn't it? It's not like you, you couldn't write tests <laughs> without some extra package. It, it's built in. That's not true of every language, um, but it is true of Go. It comes with tests included. Um, so let's see what happens here. This test must fail at some point, and we'll see how. Uh, yeah. So so, let's see. so we're in this test basic FTP handling at line four seven three. So what's the first thing that happens? Uh, so first thing that's happening is that you know it's using this u variable and it's setting it to this get test user. Okay. Uh, we can guess at that, can't we? Yeah. So it's getting a user. Uh, not then it's doing a u dot quota size and setting it to. Uh, some uh, numeric value, 655360, yeah. yep. Six and a half million. I wonder yeah. what that value means. <laughs> <laughs> or is that just the maximum value of uh, whatever that field can hold? Perhaps sure. it is. Um, I, I guess it's like, you know, in order to, this test must test FTP operations, mustn't it? So yeah. it could be uploading, downloading. If we're going to upload or download, that means we need some disk quota. Um, how much? We don't know, just probably as much as possible. Mm -hmm. We could set it to exactly what we know we're going to use, couldn't we? But that would be a bit fragile because then we'd have to change it later. So fine, just max out your quota. That's all right. Sure. What happens next? Uh, then we're going to uh, set a few more uh, variables here. So there's going to be local user. And then there's an underscore. Uh, I guess they're not going to use that uh, variable yeah, for anything. We're ignoring something with the blank identifier. Yeah. And then an error value. And it's using the HTTPD test.add user, which is taking the uh, U value, as well as a HTTP.status created. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the line below that says assert that no error t comma error right so this is where testify comes in um, is these assert is this assert package um, and this is you know if we weren't using testify what would we write here it's something like if or not equals nil t dot fatal error isn't it yep. that's not so very tedious that we couldn't bear to write it, but apparently the author of this package is not happy with that, so he wants to use the assert package to just say assert dot no error is the error. So presumably that has exactly the same effect, doesn't it? Yeah. It says it is this this error value I'm gonna give you, is that nil? If so, just carry on. But if it isn't nil, then fail the test, and in order to do that, you need the T. So here's the T as well. Um, so we could write a cert dot no error, couldn't we? Yeah. Pretty easily. Um, and we usually do. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, you know, I, I, I often get asked, you know, what do you think about frameworks like Testify, or what do you think is the best testing framework and so forth and I just sort of think it's I don't really have any strong opinions about it but I just feel like it's unnecessary you know what do you think I mean it there's some convenience here for sure but I, I don't really want to have to learn some whole extra package just to write tests sure sure yeah do you do you find yourself sort of you know suffering pain as a result of writing if or not equals nil, and you're thinking, if only I had some kind of a cert no error method, you know. Uh, yeah, I I don't think I've reached that point. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable. Just yeah, but 
Some yeah. people do, for sure. And actually, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but you know, there is a serious point to this in that you don't need any extra framework. The testing library does it all, and that's absolutely fine. There are some super convenient things in packages like Testify, which is that it's, it's not always as simple as assert no error, is it? Sometimes it's it could be things like assert not zero or assert not empty or assert x greater than y or assert not equal all of these sort of things you could imagine couldn't you and sure we could write that in code but by using named functions like this it makes it read a bit more like english doesn't it sure yeah you can actually read this and you can say something something error equals function call assert no error that's that's nice because you, you sort of understand what it's doing that's fine the problem um if the, if there is a problem i mean if you if you like the style of working by all means use it i can't legally stop you anyway um i i have only moral authority at the moment <laughs> trying to get more authority um but my problem with this style of thing is basically what happens if that assertion does fail What's the output? Well, it's basically something like error, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, suppose you have something where you, in order for the test to succeed, the result has to equal 10, and you say assert equals answer 10. And if that test fails, it just says, you know, x, x is not 10. <laughs> and the, the person looking at the test is just like, well, so what? Right. You know, what does that mean? What's X? Why should it be 10? What what, um, what does this indicate has gone wrong? That's the problem, isn't it? There's no way to know. If you think testing is basically just call the function, check that it returns the right result, and if not, fail, you could see why people would reach for something like this, couldn't you? Because it's just like, yeah, why go to the trouble of writing if X not equals 10? I can just assert it. But actually, that's the least... You know, they're thinking about the happy path where it succeeds, but the happy path is the least important path of any test. <laughs> I mean, the whole reason the tests are there is for them to fail, isn't it? Yep. At some point, I mean, not now and not all the time, obviously, but at some point that test is going to catch a bug. And I, I want it to. That's why it's there. I wouldn't bother writing the tests otherwise. If they always pass, they're no use, are they? So actually, the bit that says test error that is the most important branch in the entire test um, that's the code that i really want to focus on and not just the code but also the message i want to be able to say ha so x wasn't 10 <laughs> okay well i know exactly what must have gone wrong and here's what it is it's probably that the postgres server is not available or something please start postgres or or whatever you know There'll be some useful information we can give the programmer, isn't it, to say not just X should have been 10, but why it should have been 10 and what it means if it isn't. Sure. That's, it's a bit of a subtle point, isn't it? You know, if you're used to programming the regular go way, you, it's sort of obligatory, isn't it? If you call t.errorf, you have to give some message. So the program won't compile unless you <laughs> give useful information. Whereas with this, you're not obliged to say anything. Oh, you can just say assert dot no error, error. And um, what tends to happen is you have a whole bunch. You have a test with a whole bunch of these assertions in, any of which can fail. And if if you're the poor person who's looking at these failing tests, what are you going to do? You know. The only thing you can do is just painstakingly trace through the test code to say, well, what are all the things that have happened up to this point? Why are we asserting this? Apparently, this needs to happen, and apparently it hasn't happened. That's a lot of extra work. So I think the full force of this only really comes home to you if you've worked on some big, complicated, horrible code base with lots of tests which fail much of the time, <laughs> you know, and you have no idea why, and it's very painful to try and figure out. And you start thinking to yourself, you know, they could really have spent five more minutes just making this test a little bit more useful. Sure, yeah. Um, 
reaching for things like assertion frameworks makes it easier to just crank out a bunch of test code, sure, but that's not why we're here. Um, it, it makes it easy for you to not think about the failure path, doesn't it? Which is a mistake. We don't want to make that easy to ignore. We want to focus people's attention on it. So, fine. That, that's the end of my rant about why not to use assertion style testing. Fine, but, but we have. So we can still understand it, can't we? So what happens next? Uh, then it looks like we're going to set up um, a similar uh, assertion for the uh, SFTP user. Yeah. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll go through the uh, U. Yeah, this, this looks like exactly what you said, doesn't it? That this mm -hmm. HTTP server is some admin interface. Yeah, yeah. Because we're, we're calling that same interface both times to say, add this user. Um, one is a local user, one is an SFTP user. Mm -hmm. Fine, yeah. and... Um, apparently that add user returns um, the user. Don't know what that is because don't we already have the user? Isn't that you? <laughs> you know, we called get right, test right. user. Yeah. What's yeah. that? Just some string, perhaps? You know, yeah. Is that a user name? We, we might have. Oh no, it's a data provider dot user. Okay. Um, so what what's that local user variable then? So we call HT, we, we call get test user, we get the U, we call httpd test add user, pass it the U, it gives us back something we call local user, but what's that? So on line 476, four, seven, six. Um, this variable here, that's also a data provider dot user. Does it just give us back the same user that we passed in? It would seem like that, yeah. What's up with this API? <laughs> and what's this what's this mystery middle variable that we're ignoring? Any right, idea? right. Uh, it's... A slice of bite. Well, I'm none the wiser, are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, great, it's a slice of bite. What's in it? And apparently we don't need it because we ignore it. So, right, fine. Right. But that's maybe the response body, something like that. Are we making an API call here? I don't know. Don't care either, because I think this is pretty bad. <laughs> um, oh, that's not fair. Um, well, it's, it's it's bad in the sense that all of our programs are bad. Um, <laughs> let's or well, let's say could be better. How about that? It's sure. A bit more, yeah. bit more positive, yeah. isn't it? Sure, sure. Um, just because you're perfect doesn't mean there isn't still room for improvement. <laughs> Um, so fine. So we so we've added these two users, and then we've got some big for loop here, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. In 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 fact, this is a bit of a weird one. So it's like let's let's just read this. So we we have for a for loop with a range clause, range over the following slice literal. It's a slice of data provider dot user, and uh, consisting of local user and SFTP user. And then a bunch of code. So we're going to range over this slice, which is only two things. So what this is really saying is this block of code inside the for loop, just do that twice, once for each of these two users. That's annoying, isn't it? Like this, it seems a real shame to have a for loop just for two things. Sure, <laughs> that's sure. that's basically the minimum number of things that you could do in a for loop, isn't it? If you just had one, that would be even more of a waste of time. Um, you sort of feel like this could have been a function call, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, te uh, you know, do do test operations for local user, do test operations for SFTP user. Sure, sure. Um, but we we have a for loop. Okay, <laughs> we are where we are. That boat has sailed. Um, and then what do we do inside the loop? Uh, so inside, let's see, we're using this get FTP client and we're passing it a user uh, which is um, coming from the for loop mm -hmm. uh, true and the value nil and that is going to I guess load the client and the error value and then after that uh, we're going to go into our assertion so if assert 
Yeah, there I must be know. some sort of client object, mustn't mm -hmm. there? You know, it knows how to talk to that FTP server as, I guess, this user. And um, so we're going to create that client or try to create that client. There can be an error. And then we have if assert dot no error again, and then some blocks. So this is even weirder, isn't it? Like, yes. This feels quite awkward to me. It's like assert no error on its own. That's fine. That makes sense. Just means I assert that there, there is no error. And if, if I'm wrong, fail the test. Um, but using it as an if condition is a bit weird because now it reads wrong, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. or it's like if we could read it as if no error, I suppose. Apparently it returns bull, you know, <laughs> who knew again, like, um, that isn't obvious. Um, and then we have a bunch of stuff. We have a lot of stuff inside this indented block. Now, one thing about go, uh, another of the, the million things about go that annoys people is that it uses hard tabs, um, in the code on disk, you know, you can look at it in your editor, however you want, but on disk, the files use hard tabs for indentation and the default tab width is usually eight spaces, which is a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Most languages with indentation, it's probably four spaces or even two, um, you know, six would be a weird choice, but I don't think anybody uses eight, but go is like, we're going to go all in on this indentation thing. You know, if we, if we're going to indent stuff, we're going to indent the hell out of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I sort of think this is another of these subtle little cues that go gives us, you know, sometimes it's, it's really awkward or painful to do certain things in go, isn't it? And what that actually means is not that go sucks. Although, I mean, it may do, but this isn't evidence for it. What it means is you're, you're trying to do the wrong thing, basically. Or should we put it another way, you know, of the many ways that you could do things, um, one is usually much easier than all the others, which is just the right way to do it in Go. You know, other ways are possible, but extremely laborious or annoying or verbose or fragile or something like that. Um, and what Go is telling you with its massive tabs is that it doesn't want you indenting a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> it doesn't want too many levels of indentation, which makes sense because that makes code confusing to read, doesn't it? Sure. By the time you're sort of three levels deep in indentation, it's a bit hard to remember where you were. You were inside some if, inside some for, inside some function. You know, you almost have to keep all of this state in your brain, which is difficult. Um, and you know, so I mean, you've sensibly configured your editor to show tabs four spaces wide, which is reasonable. <laughs> but if you if you set it to eight spaces, that would make the point even more forcibly, wouldn't it? We're we're too indented here. We we shouldn't be this indented. We should try and keep out of indentation as much as possible. How do we do that? Well, one thing is we could call functions, isn't it? So instead of this for loop with an indented block, we could just call some function twice, no indentation needed. And very often, um, why are we inside a block? It's because we're in some if statement. What is the if statement about? It's usually if there's, if there's some error, isn't it? Or, or not some error. So you might say, you know, try to do the thing. If there's no error, then do the following. And that's usually the bulk of the code. Um, so it's all indented and in order to avoid that, what we would do is, is flip the if statement around, isn't it? We'd say, if there is an error, then just return. Now, because we haven't returned, we know there was no error, so we don't need to indent the rest of the code. Um, so, you know, rather than saying, if everything's okay, indented block, we say, if everything's not okay, return unindented block and we could have done something like that here couldn't we yeah but it, it would be difficult because we'd have to say if assert error <laughs> i don't know if that's a thing maybe it is um but what we really mean is if error not equals nil isn't it right that would have been if error not equals nil 
T dot fatal, fine. Now we don't need indentation. So you can see why, like, you know, maybe seems like a reasonable choice at first, but the more you look into it, the more you realize just the fact that we're using the assert package is forcing us into some weird go.